This is Think Tech Hawaii. Community matters here. One. Okay, law across the sea. I'm Jay Fidel. Here it is. Well, <clears throat> it's between 11:30 and 12 uh, here on a given Wednesday. Uh, uh, my my friend and uh, a director of Think Tech Hawaii, uh, Judge Shackley Rafetto, retired chief judge of the Second Circuit, is here to help me host this show with a friend of his for many years, and that is uh, Justice Gonzorg uh, from Mongolia. Uh, and I wonder, Shackley, if you could introduce Justice uh, uh, Gonzorg. Uh, as he should be introduced. Uh, I'd be happy to. Uh, to my right is uh, Justice uh, Ganzori Gamsorin, a former uh, Justice of the Supreme Court of Mongolia. He, he was actually in the, active in that capacity when we met maybe 20 years ago now, yeah, a long, I think long so. time ago. But since then he's done a lot of interesting things. He studied for an LLM for 10 years at American University in the U.S. and when he returned to Mongolia he served several years as a um, uh, as a, the legal advisor to the president of Mongolia, and then was uh, assistant to the prosecutor general of Mongolia and was involved in uh, criminal justice reform for Mongolia, which is the subject we, we want to talk, to talk about today. But uh, Justice Gansorg has had a very distinguished career. Um, his daughter actually uh, clerked for me in the summertime some years ago, <laughs> and she's now uh, lives in Honolulu, works for one of our appellate court judges, and is about to have a baby. <laughs> <laughs> hence, Congratulations. Hence his presence to, at this time in Honolulu. It gives us a good chance to get together and, and uh, talk about old times. Well, I'm particularly interested in, uh, in the judge's experience uh, in human rights and your degree in constitutional law from American University in Washington. What, what brought you to that? Uh, what made you want to do that, come from Mongolia to Washington, D.C., and take that program? Well, I guess it's um, a long story, but uh, I would say that the uh, uh, knowing American uh, ambassador to Mongolia, and knowing my friend, a lawyer from America, Gregory Richardson, helped me uh, to understand more about U.S. legal system and international human rights. So it was my motivation going to uh, America and doing my LLM on uh, international human rights and uh, constitutional criminal justice rights. Why that particular subject? I mean, you could have studied uh, uh, banking credit transactions too. <laughs> <laughs> Of course, that's true. However, I was a judge almost 16 years in Mongolia, and uh, I used to deal lots of uh, criminal cases, and I was military judge too. Mm. So I used to handle lots of mostly criminal cases. Uh, therefore, my experience was more in the criminal justice area, and I wanted to broaden my experience and knowledge, particularly in criminal justice area. Yeah. So, and you, you, not only did you study that at American University, but you stayed in the United States for 10 years, yep. just observing how it worked here uh, and becoming you know, more familiar with the way it's done here in the U.S. anyway. Yes, that's true. Uh, that's true because um, after my LLM degree in uh, uh, Washington, D.C., I uh, hired by uh, law firm, uh, Tabak and Associates, and I used to work as a translator firstly, and then I was handling lots of uh, immigration cases. And of course, I helped with small uh, criminal cases. And uh, uh, by doing this, and by going to a court every day, I learned lots of things in state courts in Virginia, as well as in federal courts uh, in Alexandria and the different places. And of course, my friend uh, Judge Shackley and my friend Judge uh, uh, Joyce Forlock from uh, Dallas helped me a lot to learn more. Yeah. It sounds like, you know, there's a, a kind of an evolution for you, as there was for Judge Shackley, too, um, to become an international person. Um, to do sort of cultural and legal arbitrage from one 
country one system to another mm -hmm. uh, and let me you know intersperse by asking exactly what you got into that you are you travel everywhere mm -hmm. you are following um, the development of various areas of law um, in many places uh, and, and speaking and participating in the process in many places why well it's it's very interesting to see how different societies process justice and arrive at justice you know the, the we're most familiar with the common law system Mongolia I believe is the criminal system was patterned after the modern criminal system was patterned after the German civil law yes, system that's true but their constitution provides for it that it is an adversarial process if I'm correct and they are, have recently adopted such things as a preliminary hearing before criminal charges may proceed against a, uh, a defendant all the common law concepts so it's very interesting to the, the, the thing about the common law is it's very practical <laughs> and it was it was designed that way uh, I don't know if you could say the same thing for the civil law system I don't know enough about it to really say but but I know that these devices that that other nations tend to pick up from our common law system are usually because it it's simple and it works and it's practical like a preliminary hearing tremendous protection uh, for a, a person charged with a criminal offense in any society and uh, so what is it makes what is it makes these other places interesting for you? I mean, there's got to be a practical aspect to that. I mean, one is you want to take your American experience and and mm, deliver it, expose it elsewhere, and the other is you could learn what's going on elsewhere, and maybe that's a value back home. Well, we we take for, uh, take it for granted simple things like courtrooms are public places. That's not true in China, for instance. You can't just walk into a courtroom and see what's going on. They're public in Mongolia, I believe, pretty completely, or except um, classified information yes, maybe that's being, true. Maybe being yeah. handled. Mm -hmm. Interesting. But it, it varies from country to country. Yeah. And in China, you know, the, the Communist Party makes the final decision in important cases. That's more not and true. more. Yeah, well, I don't know, but, but that's not true in Mongolia. Yeah. They have a, a standalone criminal justice or justice system, the top being the Supreme Court. Yeah, well, that's a, a kind of a remarkable process. Now, Judge, when you, when in the in the process of your 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 your, your change in the way of thinking, your uh, exposure to these human rights, civil rights, um, and uh, you know, uh, what do we call it, um, um, better treatment of of defendants in criminal mm. cases. Yes. Um, <clears throat> did you see other countries too? Did you travel elsewhere? Uh, or were you focused only on what was going on in the U.S.? No, in fact, in fact, I used to travel a lot in China, uh, South Korea, uh, Japan, Indonesia, Russia, of course. And um, what I learned from these countries that the uh, every other country is trying to make changes and doing reform, and is a uh, Judge Shackley mentioned, in these states, you accept lots of things like granted, but in many other countries, this has been common to in reality after for long struggle for reform. Yeah. So likewise, Mongolia is doing uh, big uh, criminal justice reform yeah. and uh, struggling to. Uh, pay more attention, as you mentioned, on rights of defendant. Yeah. So, um, you know, so at some point along the way, while you were in the U.S., I suppose, you decided you wanted to take this back. You wanted to see if you can apply some of the lessons. And the U.S. isn't perfect. It's not perfect. I go on record about that. <laughs> <clears throat> However, you know, there are positive things, at least in our rule of law, um, that are useful in other countries. and. Uh, you made a decision that there would be some things that would be useful in Mongolia. What caused you to make that decision? Was it the school? Uh, was it observing the cases that you saw? Was it talking to Shackley Raffetto? <laughs> <laughs> um, well, that's true. Uh, Shackley first time came to Mongolia when I was, uh, I think, when I was military judge, right? No, when you were on the Supreme Court. Yeah, at the Supreme Court, but I was still a military member. So 
uh, he used to conduct training for military judges and prosecutors. I learned lots of things from his teaching in Mongolia. And then later on, I had a chance to compare Mongolian and US criminal justice system. And you can see clearly the, the defendants and the lawyers in the states have more, much more rights than the defendants and lawyers in Mongolia. And it was striking. And then, of course, um, I was thinking, why it is, if it is possible in Mongolia, I mean, in the US, why it's not possible in Mongolia? Yeah. So, <clears throat> and I, mean, I start the, trying the, the to The exchange help. there is interesting. Is that, you know, mm. you can be, you can have a more liberal court, a more liberal set of a system without threatening it, <clears throat> without bringing it down, with, mm -hmm. without negative implications. Uh, you can you can <clears throat> come to a more liberal approach without destroying anything, and in fact benefiting everyone because it's not it's not just the accused, <clears throat> it's the society in general. Yeah. But one thing you mentioned, and uh, you guys have been talking about it, is this the connection uh, between civil criminal? I mean, <clears throat> I mean the civil law system in the civil law system, uh, as opposed to in the military law system. The judge was what the military member yes. of the Supreme Court of Mongolia. Mm -hmm. That's very interesting. You have a military member sits on that court, mm -hmm. and and Shackley has studied. You know, Shackley is a senior reserve officer for many years in the mm -hmm. Navy, um, and he studied military justice in many contexts, and he's followed it in every way. And so the, it, it raises the question of what is the connection between the reform of um, of, of of civil criminal in the civil system, criminal justice, uh, with the reform of military justice, which is also criminal. Uh, how did you get involved in that? Are you doing that, Shackley? I, I don't do that currently, but I used to work for the Defense Institute of International Legal Studies, and we sent teams all over the world to talk about rule of law, military justice, and that was one of the training sessions in Mongolia. And we went, and, and Judge Ganzorig was gathered a whole group, uh, it was the entire Supreme Court, I think, and some other judges, and we conducted training about uh, U.S. military justice and what concepts we use and uh, gave some demonstrations. And So was that of value? I mean, th th does the reform of military justice affect the reform of, um, of criminal justice in the civil law system? And what was your role on that court? Were you kind of a specialist there in military justice? Did you take the lead on military justice cases? Um, or were you sitting, just as a matter of statute, that the court requires a military justice specialist? What was your role there in that court? And, and how did that work between the two systems? Mm -hmm. You see, um, it's interesting that the, um, uh, at that time when I was uh, military, we had the uh, military uh, court. We had military prosecutors, we had military judges, and we uh, usually hold many uh, military member criminal cases. But uh, in 1990s, uh, the uh, military court in Mongolia has been dissolved. We don't have any more military court and military prosecutors. So if, I'm, big if I have uh, been charged of, a, of an offense in the military, I am in the regular court system yes. in Mongolia? Now, nowadays, uh, the case would go to uh, just civilian court. I, I, that indeed is very enlightened, the modern view for sure. Of yeah. course, of course. And then uh, once uh, the case in the military court, the uh, defendant and the lawyer would have more uh, more rights, uh, they can exercise more constitutional rights. Very interesting. We're, we're getting right to the meat of this now. <laughs> I, I, have a, I have a question. Yeah, during the Soviet period, uh, Mongolia was never part of the Soviet Union, though the you know, heavy Russian influence here. In fact, your, your legal education was in Russia, right? That's right, yeah. yeah. So you're a graduate of a Russian university law school. That's right. Okay, and now it, the military justice system that, that 
existed at that time in Mongolia that you just described, was that basically the Soviet military justice system? Or did yeah, you... very much, uh, very much like uh, Soviet uh, military. And then, when, then, at, and then at the end of the Soviet period, then th there, that was disbanded, and now cases are handled in the civilian courts. I guess that's correct. I see. Yeah. yeah. The uh, one thing I mentioned, I wanted to mention that the uh, at that time I was military judge, so Supreme Court has uh, three divisions: military, criminal, and civil divisions. So I was military judge sitting at the Supreme Court uh, as a military military uh, court division judge, mm -hmm. but we mostly handled criminal cases too. Mm -hmm. well, how many judges were on that court, are on that court? Um, I think at the time we had 22 mm. judges. Sounds like the Ninth Circuit. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so I only have one more question before the break, sure. mm -hmm. Judge Gonzalez. <clears throat> Ipan Mapruska? Uh, what? Ipan Mapruska? No. We Ipan Imanich Paruski. Paruski, yes, of course. I understand. <laughs> <laughs> the question is, do you speak Russian? Yeah. <laughs> ah. <laughs> we'll be right back after this break. We'll find out about the specific reforms in Mongolia. <laughs> this is Think Tech Hawaii, raising public awareness. Planning all week for the day of the big game. Watching at home just doesn't feel the same. What on the list is who's gonna drive? It's nice to know you're gonna get home alive. Plan for fun and responsibility. Choose a D -D. Captain of our team is a D -D. For every game day, assign a designated driver. Aloha, my name is Mark Shklov. I am the host of Think Tech Hawaii's Law Across the Sea. Law Across the Sea is on Think Tech Hawaii every other Monday at 11 a.m. Please join me where my guests talk about law topics and ideas and music and Hawaiiana all across the sea from Hawaii and back again. Aloha. True. Bingo. Well, you know, the plot thickens, okay? <laughs> Judge Gonzorek went to law school before he came to American University in the U.S. He went to law school in Russia, in Moscow, I assume, yeah. No, it's, uh, it's called Krasnodar, a small uh, town near Black Sea. Oh, okay, that's yeah. closer to Mongolia, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, it's south of Moscow, yeah. Um, anyway, yeah, so... South. So then, then we find, mm -hmm. and during the break, that in fact, after the Russian period of law, um, you know, when, when Russia was the Soviet Union, I suppose, um, uh, Mongolia adopted some German concept, German civil law, mm -hmm. which makes it very interesting. Why? <laughs> it's, I think, historically, came to Mongolia. Uh, I believe um, civil law system actually Firstly, Russians adopted from Germany, mm. and then it has been exported to Mongolia, and the Mongolians adopted civil law system from Russia. Uh. How that is how it came to Mongolia. So, what what is the biggest influence now on the system of law in Mongolia? Mm. Well, I think um, I would say um, we trying to make uh, lots of changes and big reform. And uh, currently, I would <coughs> say Mongolia is not only a civil law system country, but it has also some characteristics from common law. And it's kind of a mixture of civil law and common law system. Yeah. It sounds like you're evolving into a system that is Mongolian. It's your own brand, no? Well, um, uh, Mongolia has a rich history of uh, legal tradition, but still mm -hmm. we are trying to pick up what is the best from the two systems, what is the best in civil law system, 
and what is the best in common law system. Mm -hmm. Many, many good things uh, we can observe in common law system as what well. A, what a great time to be a lawyer and alive and a, and a former judge in Mongolia now with all of these changes now. They well, actually... uh, it's a fascinating time in Mongolia. It's uh, uh, one of my friend, uh, American lawyer said, you're doing lots of things like we did 200 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> but actually, rule of law in Mongolia dates back to Chengiz Khan when he united Mongolia. That's right? exactly true. And he pr promulgated the first, I guess it would be the equivalent of the Hammurabi Code, but in Asia, and, uh, and in order to um, regulate and monitor things, uh, trade along the Silk Road and things like that. Well, is it hard to do reform? <clears throat> Is it hard to move the needle ahead? Is it hard to reform the criminal justice system in Mongolia? Is there resistance to that? How hard do you have to work to get changes through? <laughs> well, um, changing the uh, all things is always difficult. It's even more difficult changing the whole system, whole structure, yes. which has been existed for maybe 60, 70 years. So we're going through lots of changes and of course we have mm. lots of resistance from the uh, uh, old system and uh, from other members of the uh, legal community but I'm sure it will go through and it will succeed one day and of course we can't make a revolution overnight mm. so <laughs> we're doing still step by step and uh, so far, we had lots of achievements. So you're 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 trying to lead this. You're you're being the champion for these changes, and you have a, a group of how many lawyers helping you? Well, um, uh, of course, I'm one of the uh, uh, big advocates for human rights and uh, equal rights, uh, constitutional rights, and of course, I have lots of friends and. Uh, uh, lawyers who support my idea and who support reform ideas. Um, when I was in uh, uh, America for 10 years, during the 10 years I used to uh, uh, to do training with my friend Judge Joyce Furlock and with uh, Judge Shackley uh, trainings for Mongolian lawyers. Uh, I estimated later on at least we brought 100 lawyers, uh, judges, prosecutors, constitutional court members to the states for training. And then these people now uh, doing this judicial reform. So does the public uh, go along with you? Is the public supporting uh, reform? Is there, are there, or are there people who say, no, we like doing it the old way? No, I think uh, uh, public people very much supporting the uh, uh, criminal justice reform. Good. Jackley? Oh, I was just going to say, um, it was about five years ago, uh, Justice Ganzori, when he was with the, the prosecutor general's office, brought a group of about 10 Mongolian prosecutors over, and uh, we put on to a... To the U.S., here. To, here, to Maui. And we put, a, put on a training. J.D. Kim, our prosecutor over in Maui, put on a, uh, I guess, a three- or four-day training program about how we uh, handle prosecutions. And then we came over and met with the Chief Justice Rechtenwald and also uh, the Attorney General. We were discussing how uh, Mongolian prosecutors might be able to work in the future on training issues with uh, Hawaii prosecutors and Hawaii Attorney General's office. That's a great contribution. Mm -hmm. Well, I wanted to ask you about the specific things. Uh, and sure. I, have, I have a little list. I have a little list. <laughs> <laughs> So um, I guess uh, one of the things uh, that I, I, I saw was plea bargaining. And, and you have a whole new thing. In, in, the, in, the, in the old day, the, the policeman could make decisions. The prosecutor could make decisions. Uh, there was, it was not a two-party system. The prosecutorial arm of the government would handle it even without courts and judges. That's changing. What, what have you been able, to, um, what have been able to, to introduce to that system now? Well, um, the new criminal justice reform uh, coming with two basic laws. One is new criminal code, 
the other is uh, new criminal procedure court. I uh, can say a few things about the new, uh, for example, uh, the new criminal, criminal code uh, abolished death sentence. So that is very important issue for Mongolia's human rights records. And uh, secondly, um, we introduced, for example, the um, preliminary, preliminary hearing. We didn't have preliminary hearing before. Now there is this criminal procedure code. According to this criminal procedure code, we can have preliminary hearing. We can have a hearing on the guilt issue. And then lastly, we can have separate hearing on sentencing. So that's a very, very helpful uh, for judges and for defense and defendant. Yeah. Of course, uh, another a big renewal, big new reform is the um, introduction of the uh, plea bargaining system. So that gives uh, uh, lots of rights to defense and then lots of opportunity uh, to a defendant and defense lawyer to uh, make deal uh, with the uh, prosecutors. So. <clears throat> you spoke, both of you spoke before about, about the, the public nature of court proceedings um, in, these, in these proceedings, preliminary hearing, for example. Right. Is it public? Can I, can I come in and watch? Yes, unless uh, there is certain provision in a law, unless it's related to uh, the case related to uh, minors, mm -hmm. Hmm. less than 14, that's reasonable. Uh, yeah. <clears throat> what about uh, what about jury trials? Do you have jury trials in, in no. Mongolia now? No. Is that something you want, Judge? Well, um, I think uh, full jury trial is not likely in Mongolia, but we still have in a court lay citizens. So maybe uh, up to three uh, citizens or representatives could be uh, in a court during trial. Mm -hmm. So, Shackley, you've been observing this. <clears throat> what impresses you most about the changes that have been uh, adopted in Mongolia? Well, I, I think the preliminary hearing is pretty significant to interpose a uh, decision process in between the power of the state and the, and the responsibility of the defendant to respond to charges. That's very significant. I've always thought in our system, grant, the more that we water down the grand jury or preliminary hearing process, the, it's not good. Yeah. Well, and what, what else would you like to see? I mean, <clears throat> if you mm. were just sitting here with the judge now, mm. like you are, <laughs> what would you suggest for him, um, you know, for additional changes? What would be on your list of recommendations? I'd like to learn more about the, the use of the lay, uh, lay judge. China, China talks about that a little bit, but uh, if, you, if it was actually formalized so that lay... The lay members of the, of the, I guess, judiciary, say if you had three lay members and two judges m making decisions, that could be, you're getting pretty close to a jury. Yes, you are. There, if they, it, depending on how they're selected and how they serve yes. and are they free from any kind of retribution by defendants and, you know, there's a lot of issues that go with that. Yeah. But that, that, that's more and more of a liberal justice system, I think. So, well, uh, he's... Um Judge is very right. Uh, even though we have in the court lay citizens, still we have to make a lot. Uh, uh, for example, I know in the States, uh, there is a special instruction mm -hmm. and there is a special rules for juries. But we haven't developed such detailed rules and instructions for lay citizens. And then in Mongolia, a lay citizen can be uh, sitting with the judges, like judge would sit this way. And then also when the uh, uh, judge making deliberation, he would be still in uh, consultation room with the judge. Mm -hmm. So uh, sentencing sometimes, I mean <coughs> sentencing would be also in prisons of uh, uh, lay citizen. Um, but uh, all these issues must be regulated in a detailed way. So we still need 
to develop a very good uh, detailed uh, law for uh, lay citizens or for we, we say petty jury. Are, are you done? Um, in other words, do you have other changes up your sleeve on this? Oh, we have. It's just, I would say, Jay, this is just beginning. We have to do lots of things. We have to do, it's not done yet. We uh, still, as I said, step by step, we uh, doing things and uh, uh, helping people exercise their constitutional rights. Yeah. yeah. Can I ask a question? Yes. Uh, judge, when I was there, I remember a couple of years ago, and I gave that talk to the judges mm -hmm. about uh, organized crime. One of the one of the questions that the judge, one of the judges, asked me at the end is, he said, "We we prosecute people for possession of illegal drugs, mm -hmm. but the statute is unclear. It it will provide one sentence for possession of a lot of illegal drugs, and a lower sentence for possession of less." A lesser amount, but they, but the the amount actual amount isn't defined. Like in our system, we say over an ounce, less than an ounce, more than you know. We specify in terms of ounces, so it's very specific, mm -hmm. so the judge can make a clear ruling. Have those kind of issues been um, addressed in the uh, uh, new court? Yeah. Well, um, uh, you observed very well as a professional judge. Mm -hmm. Uh, that was a big issue, big problem, but uh, unfortunately this issue hasn't been addressed in a new uh, criminal code. Mm. So it's still very difficult what is the um, criteria for defining big uh, amount of mm -hmm. drugs. It could be a big amount in uh, money terms or uh. it could be in a uh, uh, big amount uh, in, in weight mm -hmm. grams. So <laughs> My answer to the when they asked me the question, I said, "Make a lot of findings, <laughs> <laughs> Judge." When you That'll when you write it. your yeah. answer, when you if it's a lot, you talk about a lot. <laughs> well, this has really been been wonderful too. Jay, one thing I wanted to you. mention you that the, uh, <laughs> um, the new code actually introduced uh, as a sentencing travel ban mm. the travel ban imposed in the past by policemen nowadays that's not true only judge could is restrict rights of people to travel so uh -huh. that was a big deal for us too uh -huh. and a person would have their day in court on that in other words if if someone wants to ban a mongolian citizen from travel mm -hmm. he could go to the court and say Judge, there's no good reason for this, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, uh -huh. not only Mongolian cities, and many uh, foreign people also would be restricted mm. to traveling out of Mongolia. And uh, you are right, Judge. Mm. Uh, the, uh, that's again, in the past, the uh, person uh, who expected to have travel, has travel ban won't be in a court. Mm. But according to the new criminal procedure code, this person or his lawyer must be in there uh, at a court hearing. Uh, whether judge can uh, and judge can rule uh, restrict the travel mm. rights or not, but the person or his lawyer must be in there. This is great. This is great. Yes, of course. It's great that that you're talking to each other, collaborating. It's great what you're doing. It's, it's historic. It's, it's moving the needle to a better place, human rights place in Mongolia. It's so nice to have you here. Thank you so much, Judge Gizarek. Really appreciate it. Shackley, thank you for introducing us <laughs> and coming down for this show. It's lovely to have this discussion. Thank you. Aloha, you guys. Aloha. Next time again soon. Aloha. Thank you. <laughs> thank you.